Hello and welcome to Performance Evaluation and Transfer Pricing. We are covering Chapter 13 of your textbook. As we learn in this topic how to evaluate the performance of the business organization and its management, I'd like to introduce you first to this very meaningful quote. It says, every job is a self-portrait of the person who does it. Autograph your work with excellence. Isn't it amazing that we can use our God-given talents to do excellent things? And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we are so grateful, O oh Lord, for the many talents and gifts that you have given each one of us. Help us, dear Lord, to be able to use these talents and autograph our work with excellence for the glory of your name. We invite the Holy Spirit to dwell among our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, in this topic, we have five learning objectives. The first three pertains to performance evaluation, and we will cover that in part A of this lecture. The last two will cover transfer pricing, and we'll do that in part B. In learning objective one, we will explain the importance of performance evaluation and why firms choose to decentralize decision making. First up, I'd like to introduce you to the management control cycle. Most business organizations will have mission and objectives, and this will be the basis of their strategic plans, the long-term plans. These plans will be the basis of their operational plans. This may be covering monthly, quarterly, and even up to a year. That's the operational plan. And then these plans will be implemented. And so we will have the performance. And finally, there will be a need to evaluate the performance. Now, it is called a management control cycle because once performance evaluation is conducted and there are some discrepancies between the actual performance and the expected performance, then you can go back and check your operational plans, whether this has been implemented and if they were implemented well, why is there still a big discrepancy? Perhaps the plans were too challenging, too hard to achieve and there might be a need to adjust the plans. Or the management could go back to the strategic plans and thereby make some adjustments in their long-term plans. Now, it's important to note that performance evaluation is a critical part of the cycle and it is only valuable if the management act on the performance information. Now, you may recall that we have introduced you to the four types of responsibility centers, cost center, revenue center, profit center, and investment center. Now, we know that these centers or divisions could be either functional, could be the marketing, it could be the production department, it could be the finance or accounting department, or it could be geographic. Some branches could be the divisions and branches may be located in different cities or different countries. Or it could be that the division is a product type. So a company that manufactures steel, oil, and coal will have these products as their centers or divisions. Now, our focus in this topic is on the investment center. So these are the responsibility centers that will be evaluated not only on the costs incurred, not only on the revenues they incur, as well as the profit, but also on how well they have used 
the resources or the investment in that particular division. So let's now look at centralization versus decentralization. You will find that whenever we're talking about centralized organization, that is when the head office makes all the decisions. And that's why it is centralized right at the top. In a decentralized environment, managers of each division or departments are given a certain amount of autonomy. So they are given the freedom to make decisions. Now the difficulty with decentralization is that the top management will have to find appropriate level of decentralization because even though the decision will be decentralized and the different managers of the divisions will be allowed to make decisions, it's still important for the top management to have a certain amount of control. And so the top management will have to control through responsibility centers when there is decentralization. Now, what are the benefits of decentralization? There are quite a few. I actually look at these benefits like different layers. So right at the core there, the benefit of decentralization right at the center you can see is motivation and job satisfaction is a benefit of decentralization. Why is that? Because the managers with some authority or autonomy are empowered because they know that well, if I'm able to do this job, if I'm able to autograph my work with excellence, then I will feel satisfied. And so this will motivate me to work harder, not only for myself, but for the whole organization. Now let's go to the next outer layer. Managerial training for future higher level managers is one of the benefits of decentralization. You can't train the future managers unless you give them some responsibility, unless you give them some freedom to make choices. As they make decisions, they are able to be trained for higher level management. The other side of this layer is that corporate level managers have more time for strategic decisions. Why is that? Because the day-to-day -day decisions are left to the lower level managers and so the higher level managers have more time to think about the strategic direction of the company. Now let's look at the outermost layer of the benefits of decentralization look at greater responsiveness to local needs. It's important when subunits are in different geographic locations, they are the one who know what the needs of their local community would be. Whereas the head office, which might be located perhaps in another country or in the big city, will not know, all right? And so there is greater responsiveness to local needs when the manager located in that geographic location can make decisions. The other side to this is that there will be quicker reaction to opportunities and problems because the manager located in that geographic location will be able to respond straight away when there is, for example, a specialized order, a custom-made order. If they have to go back to the top management, in a big city or in another country. By the time the top management give the response, the local customer might have gone elsewhere. All right, so these are important benefits of decentralization. However, there are also costs to decentralization. These are the disadvantages of decentralization. When different responsibility center managers are given autonomy to make decisions, they may just focus narrowly on their own subunit's performance without due regard to how it may affect the other responsibility centers of the same organizations. So the managers of the subunit may ignore the consequences of their actions on other subunits and this could lead 
to dysfunctional decision making to the detriment of the whole organization. Also, when the divisions are decentralized, there could be duplication of some tasks or services. Imagine each branch might have their own marketing department, accounting department, legal department. So you can see if the marketing, for example, and the legal department, accounting department could be centralized at the head office, then there will be less cost and there won't be much duplication of tasks. And of course, the biggest disadvantage to decentralization is the loss of control of top management. And so a lot of times there will be some corporate policies whereby the top management might say, okay, the division managers can make decisions up to a certain amount, let's say up to $10,000 of expenditures, but anything above that, it has to go to the top management for approval. And so there is still some level of control that is only belonging to the top management. All right, let's move on to learning objective two. This is where we will discuss motivation theories in the context of rewarding managerial performance. Performance evaluation is actually very useful when it's tied in with the reward system. There are two broad types of rewards. The intrinsic rewards is intangible and they arise from the positive experiences of being satisfied with performing well. So intrinsic reward is not given by any outside source. It's your own feeling of satisfaction for a job well done. Extrinsic reward would be a reward that is given to an employee, for example, from an external source. Now, extrinsic reward can be tangible or intangible. For example, you are given a bonus, extra cash. That is a tangible extrinsic reward. But there are also intangible extrinsic reward, like for example, a pat on the back. You are given some kind of praise or you are given the title employee of the month. So that is extrinsic reward because it is given by someone external to you, but it leads to an intrinsic reward in a sense because you feel that you are appreciated and so you become satisfied. There are some forms of performance related reward systems. The forms may be either in the form of profit sharing or a gain sharing. What's the difference between profit sharing and gain sharing plans? Both can be cash bonuses. So in a profit sharing plan, it could be cash bonus paid to the employee based on a specified percentage of the company's profit. So when the company makes profit, then employees could have a bonus from company's profit. So in this regard, employees might be motivated to work hard so that the profitability of the company will be increased and therefore their profit share will also increase. In gain sharing, the cash bonus will be distributed to employees when the performance of the company or their segment of the company exceeds some performance target. So in the case of gain sharing, even if overall company might have not achieved their targeted profit or may even make a loss, but each department or segment achieve their performance target, they could still get their cash bonus. ESOPs, employee share option plans, are provided to employees and top management by the company. And this pertains to the right to purchase shares in the company at a specified future date and at a specified price. For example, the company might issue employee share option plans to their managers and say in five years time, so there will be a specified date there, we will sell you the shares 
at a price of say five dollars it is possible that in five years time the share prices might have gone up to a hundred dollars and so ESOPs can be used to create that incentive for managers to work hard in order for the company share prices to go up in value because if the share prices go up and they can purchase it for only five dollars even though the price has gone up to a hundred dollars then they have an incentive to work hard for the company so what you can see from here is that the motivation or the incentive for the managers and employees is right at the heart of the reward system motivation are the processes that account for an individual's intensity direction and persistence of effort towards attaining the goals there are motivational theories that need to be considered by managers when they are designing the performance evaluation and reward system I will introduce you to two theories of motivation, but there are a few others out there. For example, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs is also used as a motivation theory. And there is also McGregor's theory of motivation. But here, I'll introduce you first to Herzberg's two-factor theory. According to Herzberg, there are two factors that need to be present in order for anyone, employees, students, people, to be motivated. There must be hygiene factors first. These hygiene factors provide the setting for encouraging employee motivation, but on its own, hygiene factors do not motivate the employee. So what are examples of hygiene factors? working conditions, wage levels, rules and regulations, relations with colleagues, job security, all these according to Herzberg are hygiene factors. So when they are present, it will help prevent employees to be demotivated. But on its own, these hygiene factors will not motivate. All right. So that's the first factor. The second factor is the motivator. So these are the ones that need to be present to motivate employees. These motivators are those factors that relate to job content, which provide employee motivation according to Herzberg. So what are examples of motivators? Achievement, recognition, the nature of work, responsibilities. All right, so if you give autonomy of responsibility to managers, according to Harrisburg, that will form part of motivators that could lead to job satisfaction. Also opportunities for personal growth. And of course, it won't hurt to have some cash bonuses for a job well done. So these two factors must be present in order for employees to be motivated. Let's go now to the next motivation theory and this is known as the expectancy theory introduced by Vroom. According to this, employee motivation is a result of the strength of the relationship between three factors, expectancy, instrumentality, and valence. So expectancy refers to the perception that the effort will lead to a certain performance. Instrumentality is the perception that the performance will lead to a desired outcome. And valence is the attractiveness of the reward. Why are you studying hard, for example? You are expecting that your studies, your degree when you graduate will land you to a good job. All right? So your effort will lead you to the performance and that performance will help you earn a degree that will lead you to a desired outcome getting the job that you want all right now valence is the attractiveness of that reward why do you want to get a job it's because you wanted to get good salary is it or is it because you wanted to have the prestige or is it because you want to contribute 
to the community, to the well-being of the public, perhaps is all of the above. And that actually pertains to the attractiveness of the reward. That's the reason why you are working hard in order for you to earn the degree. So now let's move to the third learning objective. This is where we'll calculate and have an appreciation of the advantages and disadvantages of three financial performance measures. So we'll be looking at return on investment, residual income, and EVA economic value added. We will consider this illustrative example for Liberty Inn. What we are given here are the balance sheet extract and the income statement extract of the three divisions of Liberty Inn. We have Albany, Broome, and Cityville. We'll just call them A, B, C. So we can see that the operating income for a is 166,000, for B is 240,000, and for C is 1,152,000. So which of the three divisions is the most successful? If we just look at the operating profit, we'll say it's C. Now, a major weakness of comparing just the operating incomes alone is that it ignores the differences in the size of its investments for each hotel. The investments that we are referring to here pertains to the resources or assets that are used to generate the income. There are three accounting-based performance measures that we will discuss. The first is return on investment, ROI. The second is residual income, or RI. And the third is economic value added, EVA. So let's start with return on investment. Using the figures provided for Liberty Inn, we can calculate the return on investment, also known as return on assets, ROA, being the operating profit divided by the average operating asset. So the ROI for each hotel would be, for Albany, it will be 166,000. The operating income as shown in the income statement abstract divided by the operating asset which in this case is the total asset as shown in the balance sheet extract. All right, and that would give us 18%. For Broom, we will divide 240,000 by $1 million, and that would give us an ROI of 24%. For Cityville, we will divide the operating income of 1,152,000 by the total assets of 5,600,000 giving us ROI of 21%. So looking at the ROI, it seems that B has the highest followed by C and A has the lowest ROI. Now let's move on to residual income. What is residual income? This is the amount of profit that remains or the residual that is left after subtracting an imputed interest charge that is based on the required rate of return, the RRR, that the firm expects from its investment. So think of it this way. If I am borrowing $100,000 from the bank and the bank charges me 10% interest, then my required rate of return should be that 10%. I would really want to earn more than 10%. So if, for example, during the year, I made a profit of $30,000. So $30,000 is not my residual income. I need to subtract the cost of capital. So the cost of capital is $100,000 times 10%. So that would be $10,000. So my profit was $30,000. Then I'll deduct the cost of capital of $10,000. So my residual income would be $20,000. So let us apply that with Liberty Inn. So remember that RI is simply the profit minus the cost of capital. And the cost of capital is calculated by multiplying the invested capital 
by the imputed interest rate or the required rate of return. So assume that for Liberty Inn, the RRR is the cost of equity capital as shown here, 14%. So now we can calculate the residual income for Albany. We've got total assets of 900,000 taken from the balance sheet extract. Multiply that by 14% and that would give us $126,000. So that's the cost of capital for A. Then we will deduct that from the operating income, which is 166,000 minus 126,000. So that is 40,000 residual income. Let's go to B. B has $1 million in assets from the balance sheet extract times the 14% required rate of return, 140,000. Then we'll deduct that from the operating income of 240,000. So that would give us an RI of 100,000. For C, we have total assets of $5.6 million times 14% rate, that would give us 784000 And since the operating income for C is $1,152,000, we will deduct 784000 from that and we'll get a residual income of $368,000. So as you can see, all the three divisions have positive RI, but the one with the highest residual income is Cityville because you can see that it has the biggest amount of investment of the three. Let's now move on to the third accounting-based measure, and that is EVA. So EVA really is a more refined type of residual income, and it has attracted considerable attention. So how do we calculate EVA? It is simply no PAT minus the cost of capital. NOPAT stands for net operating profit after tax. Now, the cost of capital is calculated by multiplying the capital employed CE by the weighted average cost of capital WAC. So capital employed is simply your total assets minus current liabilities. And the weighted average cost of capital, when it is not given, has to be calculated. So let's start by calculating the net operating profit after tax for each division. For Albany, we will start by multiplying the 166,000 operating profit before tax by 1 minus the tax rate. As shown here, the tax rate is 30%. So 1 minus the tax rate of 30% would be 70% or 0.7. So the net profit after tax for Albany would be 166,000 times 0.7 and that would give you 116,200. For Broom, we'll do the same. 240,000 times 0.7 will give us 168,000 and for Cityville, 1,152,000 times 0.7 will give us 806,400. Then we will calculate the weighted average cost of capital because it's not given here. So what is provided are the long-term debt value of 4.8 million and the interest rate of 10%. They also told us that the equity capital has a book value of $2.2 million but a market value of $4.8 million and the cost of equity capital is 14%. So we actually have two types of capital here, the debt capital and the equity capital. In the real world, the debt capital would normally be lower compared to the equity capital because the equity holders are taking on higher risk in the event that the company is liquidated who gets paid first it's the creditors first only once all the creditors have been paid then the equity holders will be paid so higher risk means higher expected return now 
To calculate weighted average cost of capital, we will multiply the market value of the debt by the effective cost of that debt. We are told that the interest rate is 10%, but you know what? The interest expense is tax deductible. So really, the effective cost of debt is cheaper than 10% it is reduced by the tax rate. So the effective cost of debt should be 10% multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate. And we already know that 1 minus 0.3 is 0.7, right? So when we multiply 10% times 0.7, we actually get 7%. So the effective cost of debt is even cheaper than 10%, it is 7% only. That is because the interest expense arising from debt is tax deductible. What about the cost of equity capital? The cost of equity capital will be just 14%. We are not going to reduce this by the tax rate because dividends are not tax deductible. So to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, we will be multiplying 7%, the effective cost of debt capital, by the market value of the long-term debt, which is $4.8 million, plus 14%, which is the equity capital cost, multiplied by the market value of the equity, which is 4.8 million, not the 2.2 million, because 2.2 million is the book value. We always use the market value. And then we will divide this by the total of the market value of debt and the market value of equity. So to do that, we can see here 7% times 4.8 million, the market value of debt, plus 14%, multiplied by the market value of equity capital, 4.8 million, divided by the total of the market value of debt and equity. So 4.8 million plus 4.8 million is 9.6 million. And so we will get the weighted average cost of capital of 10.5%. Now that we have calculated the weighted average cost of capital, we'll just have to calculate the capital employed, which is simply total assets minus current liabilities. So the total assets for Albany is 900,000 minus the current liabilities of 50,000. That would give us 850,000 capital employed for A. For B, we'll do the same. 1 million minus 150,000, we'll get 850,000. And for C, it is 5.6 million minus 300,000, and so we'll get $5.3 million. So what do we do next? We can now calculate the cost of capital for each division. For A, the capital employed is 850,000 times the WAC of 10.5%. That would give us 89,250. B has the same capital employed and of course the same weighted average cost of capital so that also gives us the same cost of capital of 89,250 and finally C has 5.3 million dollars of capital employed times the WAC of 10.5 percent so 556,500 is the cost of capital after that we can calculate our EVA, which is simply what? No PAT minus the cost of capital. So we have already calculated our no PAT for A, B, and C as 116,200, 168,000, and 806,400. So we can just put it there. Then we deduct the cost of capital that we have calculated here. And so we'll get EVA for Albany as 26,950, for Broom is 78,750, and for Cityville it is 249,900. As you can see, all the divisions EVA are positive. So that means that each division are adding value. 
if the EVA is negative, they are actually diminishing the value of the company as a whole. Now let us discuss the pros and cons of each of these accounting-based performance measures that we have discussed. Let's start with the advantages and disadvantages of ROI. One of the biggest advantages of ROI is that it considers the relationships between the asset sales and the costs. Also, when the company uses ROI as their measure, the efficient use of assets and cost efficiency become an important focus for managers. And so the buildup of assets will be discouraged. And of course, ROI is so widely used mainly because it is easy to calculate and easy to understand. But on the downside, ROI encourages narrow focus on short term rather than the long term. So some managers might not improve on their asset base and as a result, they might lose competitive advantage because their competitors are already updating their assets. But some managers might not want to do so in order to maintain higher return on investment. Another disadvantage is that it encourages investments in new assets to be delayed because increased value of assets means that lower ROI will be achieved. And finally, this is perhaps the biggest disadvantage of ROI usage is that it discourages managers from investing in acceptable projects, which leads to dysfunctional decisions. Let us have a look at this example to illustrate this third disadvantage. Let's say that Broom has an opportunity to invest 100000 to earn 20000 profit. So that investment opportunity will give a 20% return. 100,000 investment, 20,000 profit, right? Now, the current ROI for Broom, as we have calculated, is 24%. If Broom go ahead and invest with this new opportunity, the overall ROI will be lower than 24%. Because if you calculate that, it will only be 23.64%. Now, if you are the manager and your bonus is dependent on ROI, will you invest? Most likely not because a lot of times companies will say that you will get the bonus if you either maintain or increase your ROI. So in this particular case, the manager of Broom will say, no, it doesn't look good. I used to have 24% last year. Now it will show 23.64%, I better not. But from the point of view of the company, is this investment opportunity good? Well, what is the cost of capital? The equity cost of capital was, if you recall, 14%. The debt capital is even cheaper, 10%. And if you consider the tax, it's only 7%. So the weighted average cost of capital is only 10.5%. An investment opportunity that will give you 20% return, therefore, is looking attractive, right? But if the reward system is such that the bonus is only based on ROI, then this investment opportunity will not be taken into account by the manager. So that's the reason why it's really important to have your reward system and your performance measures well thought of. Okay, let's now look at the components of return on investment. Now, return on investment is sometimes called return on asset, and it's also sometimes known as the rate of return. All right, so all those acronyms are pertaining to the same measure. All right, so let's talk about this DuPont method of profitability analysis. This recognizes that there are two basic ingredients to making profit. The first one is to increase the income per dollar of revenues, and that's what we refer to as the profit margin. The second component 
is using the assets and the investments to generate more revenues or sales. And that is what we refer to as the asset turnover ATO. So the ROI is divided into these two components. The profit divided by the sales is your profit margin, also known as the return on sales. And when you multiply this by the asset turnover, which is also known as investment turnover, we calculate this by sales divided by the invested capital. The product of these two components will be equal to the return on investment. So let us now calculate these two components of ROI for Albany, Broom, and Cityville. So the return on sales or profit margin for A would be 166000 the profit, divided by the sales, $1.1 million. So that is 15%. The asset turnover, also known as investment turnover for Albany, would be $1,100,000, the sales, divided by the invested capital, which is the total assets for $900,000, and we'll get $1.22. When you multiply 15% by 1.22, you will get 18%. And that's exactly the ROI that we've calculated earlier. So for Broom, you'll do the same 240,000 divided by 1.2 million. The sales will give us 20% return on sales or profit margin. And the ATO would be 1.2 million divided by 1 million the total assets and that would give us 1.2 so 20 percent times 1.2 24 percent and that's roi so you get the idea for cityville you'll be doing the same calculation all right there are some additional insights that you could gather when you consider the two components of roi for example the profit margin is normally higher for companies that would like to, for example, increase their selling price as a result of providing better service. So companies that are using the generic strategy of product differentiation might have higher return on sales, but their investment turnover or asset turnover might be lower because when the selling price are higher, there will be not much volume in terms of sales, all right? So as you can see here, whilst Albany has 15% return on sales, it has the lowest profit margin. It actually has the highest asset turnover compared to the other two, 1.22 as opposed to just 0.57 for Cityville. But Cityville has a much higher return on sales, much higher profit margin, 36%, but its investment turnover is much lower. So perhaps Cityville is differentiating compared to Albany, which is more likely to be adopting cost leadership. But on the whole, Albany still has lower ROI compared to Cityville that has higher profit margin. All right, let's now move to the advantages and disadvantages of residual income and EVA. Remember that EVA is a form of RI, so they share common advantages and disadvantages. RI and EVA are more likely to promote goal congruence compared to ROI. Because with RI and EVA, as long as there is positive residual income or EVA, the manager will invest. Unlike that example that I gave you with ROI, there is a 20% return, but the manager might still not invest. So that's goal incongruence, whereas RI and EVA will promote goal congruence. Another advantage is that RI and EVA takes account of the organization's required rate of return in measuring performance, and it encourages the investment in projects which yield positive residual income to the organization. On the downside, though, 
RI and EVA formula are actually biased in favor of larger businesses or larger responsibility centers not like ROI. You can use ROI to compare different divisions even though they are of different sizes. RI and EVA could be misleading when you assess the relative performance of businesses of different sizes. ROI was good for that purpose. And finally, RI and EVA can encourage short-term orientation focus, but that's the same as with ROI. So both ROI as well as RI encourages short-term focus. Now, what are the effects of EVA? It will encourage the reduction in assets. It also will encourage the take up of any project which has a positive EVA. Why? Because any positive EVA, no matter how small, adds to the overall EVA and therefore better performance outcome of the company. So what can managers do to improve EVA? Well, they can, of course, earn more after tax operating income with the same capital. So don't change the capital composition, but try to increase your operating income after tax. What about if you can't increase your after-tax operating income? Well, you could use less capital to earn the same after-tax operating income and you will still increase your EVA. And finally, of course, if you can invest capital in high-return projects, then you could improve EVA. So to close this first part of the lecture, I will summarize the important insights that we can get from the calculations and discussions that we have shown earlier. It is important that incentive schemes and reward system is used to encourage goal congruent behavior. And we can do that by taking into account what sort of measures we use as the basis for the incentive scheme. ROI can encourage managers to focus on achieving high profits through the efficient use of assets. But the managers must remember that it can also encourage dysfunctional decisions. Finally, how can we discourage dysfunctional decisions? Well, by using a range of alternative measures. So instead of just using ROI, perhaps you could use other measures such as RI or EVA. And also having a range of incentive schemes that are focusing not only on short term, but also on long term, such as the ESOPs, the employee share option plans. All right, so this is it for part A of the lecture. We'll continue with part B in a short while. Bye for now.